Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. We continue with Gaussian processes, and today will be the last lecture on Gaussian processes. But we will see some more fancy stuff you can do with it, in particular how to use it for classification. And then the mass suddenly is not so nice anymore because everything becomes non-Gaussian. And I show you how to do a Laplace approximation then to do it. But I give you a superficial introduction to these topics, so don't worry, it won't be too hard, only a little bit hard. But before that, we will also talk about a couple of other things, um, about how to design kernel functions and also how to do model selection, which is just a little repetition of a chapter that we've seen before. Last time there was also a problem with the Matern kernel, and of course I tried to solve it. I think I partially solved it. So again, this is our Matern kernel implementation that I had. And one thing I changed is I changed the absolute minus, so it was everyone should, so the differences were just with minus and then absolute values, and instead I'm now using squared distances, which simplifies a little bit the code, but it didn't solve everything. So because of the way I'm implementing this here, it can happen that if I have, uh, that the diagonal entries are all zero. However, the diagonal entries should be all equal to one. So there's sometimes this issue that for something going to infinity, it should converge against one. However, when you calculate it for some zero, then you get some infinities or some other things, and you won't get the one at the end that you want. So for that reason, I just hard-coded that everything that is like below a threshold on this matrix that I calculate, yeah, that I, I will set to one, which in this case is sigma squared. So that is the value that the matter and kernel evaluates for the diagonal. And um, again, now here's some info. How did I then try and how did I evaluate it? I didn't spend infinite amount of time that would have been required really for the Matern kernel, but I just looked at the implementation from the SK Learn toolbox and I compared the numbers and they are kind of similar. However, there are some implementation details now I would have to dig deeper because there was, there's a mathematical formula from the Rasmussen Williams book, which for me is a reference. Yeah? And then there's the SK Learn implementation, and I'm sure they also looked into Rasmussen Williams, but maybe spent a little bit more time on implementing the Matern kernel. So now one really should compare code next to code. But qualitatively, it's kind of giving me similar numbers, which was fine for me so far. Also, I plotted like uh, the Gaussian kernel, which has like nice ones on the diagonal, in this case, sigma squares on the diagonal, and I get now similar result for the Matern kernel. And before that, I had like zeros along the diagonal. And that's very bad because then the matrix is no longer positive definite if I have these zeros on the diagonal. So you see, um, when, you, when you get code like this, or when you want to implement code like that yourself, it's often very fiddly, and there are the little details, right? And that's why it's very often important to evaluate these functions for small examples and then to see whether they make sense. And if there's a reference implementation in Fortran from 1978, you should compare it against that one, whether you get the same numbers or not. If you don't get the same numbers, you should dig deeper and try to find out. Maybe you find a bug in old code or your implementation still has a bug. So why am I stressing that? Because often in computer science what we do like these simple formulas, like these little helper functions at the beginning. We just implement them, and then we, we think, yes, they are right, they are simple, right, and they compile or they are interpreted, everything is fine, and you never look at the numbers that you get, and you don't compare it. And then you run your evaluation, you run Gaussian processes on big data sets, and the results are so-so, and then your, re then your reasoning will be, okay, GPs are not very good. Okay, GPs are, but actually the main reason is that you have a bug in your implementation somewhere, and the implementations are somewhat sat subtle for numerical reasons, for example. And so it's very important when you do a, implement something complicated that you do it step by step, and the stuff that you implemented, you need to check whether it's kind of, you do the sanity checks, whether everything is like, makes sense also in your head. So that's just a side note. And I experience it a lot that my code is not working in the little details, right? And I expect that that's the same for you. So far, so good. So that's the Matern kernel. I don't show you now an example with the Matern kernel because it doesn't look yet as I wanted to look it, and it would have required more parameter tweaking to get the right effect. Um, 
let's continue with kernel design. Okay, so that is the thing given some known kernels where you know some properties, how can we have more kernels? And I kept the chapter quite short, but there's a bigger section in the Rasmussen Williams book if you really want to get into this. Um, there's a big table of a couple of kernel functions. So this is the list of possible kernel functions that are really different from each other. Yeah? So they are not, cannot be written like as simple special cases of each other, but they are really different from each other. Maybe apart from the constant and the linear kernel, which is a special case, of course, of the polynomial kernel. But um, those are here for completeness. Then there are also some, uh, some properties listed back here. So the ND, I won't say much about it. So it's about degeneracy, which is more an advanced topic, yeah, which I don't cover here. But so there are some classification or categorization that you can do here yeah, for the different function. And then there's the one, the stationarity, the S, which basically says that it's only about the distance between two data points. So basically those kernels all calculate the distance between data points and then they're applied to the distances. Okay, and then you do something with it. However, some kernels are not stationary like the polynomial kernel, right? So why is that? Because it's not applying somehow, it's not applied to the distance of the two vectors, but you multiply them directly. Yeah? Whereas in the other functions, you have this parameter r, which is basically the distance between x and x prime, okay? And that's then stationary. Why does it make sense to call this stationary? Because it doesn't matter where these vectors are, right? Whether they are super large or whether they are super small, it's only about the distance between those two vectors. So no matter if you have a data set and you shift it through space to somewhere else, to Alpha Centauri, and then you rotate it, okay, then your stationary kernel functions will give you exactly the same kernel matrix. However, a polynomial kernel, of course, depends on where your data is, right? If you are far away, suddenly the larger terms, they will dominate and you get some super large numbers, okay? Those are all some considerations, but I only want to um, highlight like a little bit of this discussion, but I won't go into much detail here. The other thing to note is they all look a little bit like densities, right? Um, why do they sometimes look a little bit like densities, like the Gaussian kernel, which the Bayesian people like to call squared exponential? Because kernel functions are calculating similarities, right? And so suppose you have one data point over here, let's call it A, and you want to calculate similarity to this data point with some other data point, right? Then one description, of course, for the A would be if I have the PDF, yeah? So that might be the PDF, P of A. In this case, it looks a, a little bit like a Gaussian distribution. And then the similarity could be taken by, if I have another point, I could calculate this similarity P sub A at the location B, right? And now, if the points are very similar, it's the case when this density is very large, okay? So that's why these densities are, any density that you can think of, is like a natural candidate, like for similarity. But there are many more possibilities, okay? Of course, here again, the scaling is arbitrary and these kind of things, so I can also say 100 times such a number, so it doesn't need to be normalized to be a similarity. That's a much more vague concept. Sometimes we have some weird kernels, maybe another one that I would like to um, highlight here. Suppose uh, you're measuring this climate data, yeah? That, uh, there's some data set, maybe we have a little look on it, so which was looking like this. And that was the CO2 level at the Mauna, Lua, Kea, I forgot the name, some hill on Hawaii. And it's a CO2 level, and it looks like it's decreasing for the last 50, 80 years, constantly, with every year. So that's something that's quite surprising, right, for an Earth system. However, now we are all in the climate catastrophe. We are primed on that, so we know what's going on, right? So the CO2 levels are raising on this very nice measurement at Hawaii, where the air is always nicely mixed. There's nothing but ocean around it, and so you get a very nice data point there. But you see these periodic movements on it, right? And where do these periodic things come from? They are coming basically through the, through the seasons of the year. 
So every bump basically has a distance of exactly one year. Now, if we would model such data, it would be nice to take that into account that we know there's some periodicity in here, right? So it would be nice to have a combination of different kernel functions. So one kernel function could be like a linear trend, okay? So our kernel A comma B could include just a linear kernel, okay, plus some constant offset, and maybe we would also put some L squared in front of it for the scaling, yeah? So that would be, we are now designing a nice kernel, but what about the periodicity? Can we also take that into account? And yes, we can by now adding another one with another parameter in front of it, and that will be a kernel which is like periodic, okay? Some periodic kernel function. And now, this, if I sum up two kernel functions, it's like saying, so similarity is a number which is large if they are similar. So if one of the kernels says A and B are similar, then they are overall similar. So the plus sign here works like an OR, like a logical OR. Either that one says, yes, they are similar, right? Because they are like on a straight line. Or that one says they are similar because we detected some periodicity. Now, how would such a similarity measure look like for a periodic kernel? Basically, we would need something that after a fixed interval, so where's my sponge? Over here. So that over a fixed, with some, with some interval, always says, yes, I'm similar. So let's say this is A, and this is A minus 365 days. Okay, and then I have A plus 365 days, okay? And I would say, okay, if I'm close by, I'm similar, fine. But now I also want to be similar over here, and I also want to be similar over here and over here and over here, okay? That's also something that could be thought of is possible, right? Now, this is not really a nice density describing the A or something, but it's something else, right? And I could say, if I have like a multiple of 365 as a distance between some B and the A, then I say they're very similar. So why is that something clever? Because it allows us to average, for example, all those values. That will happen basically in, the, uh, in our um, posterior mean function, right? Where we calculate similarities, and the similarities are like weights to, weight to combine these um, numbers here, like as a linear combination. And part of it will be explained by some linear drift, and part of it will be explained by a periodicity. Okay? So let's again have a quick look at these mean functions here. Is there a periodic one? No, here's none. But there's a neural network. Okay, but there is also a periodic kernel, and I think I have it in my implementations. Let's see. So here's a periodic kernel function. I also copied it from Rasmus and Williams, so that's quite compute book, this one. And how does it work? Okay, so I'm basically, okay, I'm calculating the distances, so this is like the absolute value of distances, and then I'm taking the sinus function of that one, okay? But before I, I multiply it also with one of, one of the, oh, that is just pi, with one of the parameters, which is here the period, so one of the hyperparameter of these, um, periodic kernel is basically the, the time period once it repeats. Of course, if you know this is like climate data and we know something about the physics, right? So there's a sinusoidal motion, right? The Earth is turning around and we know it takes 365 days. We know the period exactly of these things. We can plug it in and we could set that not, we don't, won't keep it as a hyperparameter, but we would hard code it. And we would just care about um, learning about the scale and learning about some, some other things in here, okay? And so this periodic kernel could be then super useful to model like more complicated data set. Um, so I, I think I copied the, um, let's evaluate this stuff. I don't know, did I do this already? So just for fun, let's take this Mauna Kia data set, no, Mauna Lua, okay, sorry. So that is this data set, so that is, so we can also zoom in, I guess. So you see some periodicity here. So those are CO2 measurements. Right? 
of climate data. And um, how do I zoom out again? Oh, yeah, like this. And then there's also, in this definition of the data set, I'm also defining now a prior covariance function, so my kernel function. As you can see, it's like a complicated linear combination of many things. So there's some squared exponential kernel, some rational quadratic, and whatever, some periodic kernel function, and it's all combined in a complicated way. And there's a section, I think, okay, it says page 122, so let's have a look at the book, uh, Rasmussen Williams, and page 122 is probably 142. Is it that one? Almost. So here's the discuss dis discussion of exactly this data set. And um, for practical, for I would like to encourage you to look at this. It's not that I'm now saying, oh, this will be in, the, in something or blah, blah, blah. This is just a very nice worked out example how to design a kernel function, how to include prior knowledge. So it's about this CO2 data. This is the data set. And um, ideally, kind of our GP prediction will be something like this, right? So it should kind of continue this curve. But the variance is increasing. We don't know what's happening. And of course, also, if there are some policy changes, some law enforcement, whatever, CO2 reduction, then the curve will take a different direction, right? But from this data, kind of, we can interpolate what would, f would happen. And here they discuss very nicely how they take, why they take these different kernel functions and combine them. So there are some um, rational quadratic, and then there's something about decay f away from exact periodicity, and so on and so forth. So there's a big discussion on what to do. And finally, they have a complicated covariance function. And from that one, you can sample. And when you sample from it, you get curves that look like that one, OK? So it's exactly one that is going periodic and that might have some drift. And then you could show these prior samples to some climate experts, and then she might say, yes, they all look like real curves. I can't identify the real ones. So the ones that you generated from your prior, they all look like something reasonable. And if that's the case, you can do posterior GP, and then you get an estimate given your data set. Okay? Um, and so there are other examples, robot arm, inverse dynamics, and so on and so forth. And here you also see the data, I think, is only until 2003 when the book appeared. Of course, it's now interesting. I guess it just continued like that so far, right? I think we haven't done enough. OK, so that's something what is understood as kernel design. And um, there's, there's a lot to say. So there's like a, some periodicity for like longer length scales, and then there's or some effects for longer length scales, some for smaller length scales, and so on and so forth. So the more expert you are, the better you can design your kernel function. OK, so far so good. Um, ah, where's my slides? OK, let's close that one. So Typically, if you understand what the properties of these kernels are, and if you are a domain expert, then you can be very creative about it. So um, I said already, there are lots of hyperparameters to tune. And just exemplarily for the squared exponential, there are these two hyperparameters. There's the output length scale and the input length scale. And I think I demonstrated already the effect of those, maybe just mathematically discussing it. So, why is that still a kernel function if I multiply some sigma square to it? It's just if I'm positive definite, I know that for any vector v, v times k times v is greater or equal to 0, right? That's the definition of positive definiteness. So if I scale my kernel matrix with a positive constant, I can just drag it out, and I can prove that this is also greater or equal to 0, OK? So here's a preview of the exam, right? Now you could imagine. I give you another operation, scaling with minus 5. OK, and you should say, is it still positive definite or not? And if not, please prove it, OK? And then you could show it. Or let's say um, we sum up two kernel matrices, and then you should say, is it still positive definite or not? And of course, just by linearity of these operations, so it's linear in k, in the entries of k. So you get a quick proof that it's still positive definite. We can also scale the inputs. and. That's a bit more tricky, but one can show that if you have a monotonically increasing transformation and scaling with the constant is monotonically increasing, then everything is fine and you can do it. Okay, so that's no problem. Okay, and as I said, the 
output, uh, this scaling the outputs is like increasing the range of my possible functions, and scaling the input is like making the function more wiggly, for example, for the squared exponential. So here's a slide on how to make new kernels from old. And I showed it already on the board. I showed you in the book. Yeah, so those are the rules. Of course, I can scale the output. That's something you can always do with any kernel function. And basically, it means that my function will have a larger variance. So far, so good. I can scale the input. And that basically determines the length scale of the input. So basically, are points similar to each other or not? On what length scale are points similar to each other? However, here are some other interesting things that I've shown you already. You can add up to kernel functions. And here's a proof. If k and k1 and k2 are positive definite, right, then also k1 plus k2 is positive definite because I can just rewrite this product as a sum of these two quadratic forms. And if each of them is greater or equal to 0, the sum is also greater or equal to 0. Okay, So you're allowed to sum up kernels. However, they have an interesting meaning. So since they detect similarity by calculating numbers which should be large if there are similarity, this is like a logical OR, like I just said on the board. Okay, So they could be either similar because we are a multiple of 365 days away, or they could be similar because of other reasons Okay, that another kernel will describe. Of course, if there's logical OR, we also want to have logical AND. Okay? And curiously, you can also just multiply two kernel functions. And note that this is not multiplying two matrices here with each other. This is like Hadamard product. So here we are multiplying two components, two entries. So if you have two vectors, A and B, K kernel K1 calculates a single real number, and you can multiply it with a second real number. Okay? And now again, remember, K1, K2 detect similarity, but now they get multiplied. So if one says, no, they are not similar, they are not similar, I say 0, then the product will be 0 as well. Okay? That's why it's like a logical AND, yeah? which is quite nice, because this logical OR, logical AND, length scale, output scale, that's something you can discuss with your domain expert. Okay? Um, the proof here is more involved. This is really non-trivial, yeah? that, the, that the Hadamard product of two positive definite matrices is, again, a positive definite matrix. That's more complicated, and there's a theorem due to Schur, yeah, which you might know from the Schur complement from numerics or something. Yeah? So that's more non-trivial, but it's also the case. So this is a quote from Philip Hennig, who's a former colleague of mine and who's really a, a, a great expert on GPs. So he, he says, these rules can encode prior knowledge in Gaussian models. And at the beginning, maybe it sounds a bit boring, like in, in linear regression, you say, yeah, but how should I choose the parameters of my, um, of my weight vector, right? So what should be the mean? Why is 0 the mean, right? So why is that the right variance? So here now, with these kind of mechanisms, you can become very creative. And you can design interesting kernel functions. Then you sample functions from it, and you show it to your domain expert, OK? And you show the real data from, to your domain expert. You show the generated data from the prior. And if the expert cannot distinguish between the prior generally dated data and the real data, your prior is super good, and you should apply it to the real data. OK? So far, so good. Any questions about it? OK, the next obvious step is, OK, fine, yeah, sure. We can do this. We can have all these combinations of kernels, right? But every of these gets another length scale, an output length scale. They have some input length scale. Yeah? So they have, there are now lots of parameters. With lots of parameters, I mean 12. But 12 parameters in a super nonlinear function is a lot, OK? Maybe in neural networks where we have 12 billion parameters, things get easy because we have billions of parameters. Yeah? In high dimensional spaces, there are many shortcuts. It's, but maybe that's just a wrong intuition. But that's my impression that in high dimensions, there's always a way around the local optima. But that's another story. In 12 dimensions, it's super hard to optimize it. And first of all, so what can we optimize? So how can we optimize these hyperparameters? Of course, we could say, uh, we do cross-validation, right? So we just do a grid search on this 12-dimensional space. But this is very expensive. And hey, we are Bayesians right now, right? So we should have a Bayesian way of doing this with some base rule or some 
marginal likelihood or something like that, as we've seen previously for linear regression. And actually, we can follow exactly the same route as in linear regression and do exactly the same thing. So let me show you very briefly how we did it. So how do we choose all those hy hyperparameters in a Bayesian way? How can we do model selection for GPs? Again, this is a reminder. I showed you this slide already, model selection for regression. So usually, we first talk about the likelihood, which tells us how to do a measurement, right? So given that we know the truth, yeah, we know the true parameter, and we have some locations, now, how likely is it that we've seen certain things? So that is about measurement noise, OK? And it's typically a Gaussian distribution. Um, and then in Bayesian linear regression, for the parameter, we have a prior distribution, OK? And the prior distribution looks kind of arbitrary, but let me tell you, it is as arbitrary as a regularization term that you add to your optimization in classical optimization. That's also typically quite arbitrary and motivated by numerical reasons or by hand wavy reasons. So the prior of the parameter is quite similar. However, my prior might now also involve some hyperparameters, right? So it could be hyperparameters of how long is the vector w? What basis function am I using? And that is now typically covered in a hyperparameter. Again, why is there this distinction between parameter and hyperparameter? Or well, actually, there are several layers. So there's the unknown measurement. That's the bottom layer. Then there's the parameter to find that one. Then there's the parameter to find the parameter, which is the hyperparameter. And we could go on. The reason is, typically, fixing like the parameters and the hyperparameters gives us a way to estimate the y, for example, an unknown y, if we know the parameters or we can sample it. And similarly, estimating the parameters can be done when we fix the hyperparameter, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of about the structure of my model, that something is hyper and something else is hyper-hyper. Okay? So it typically comes from the way I write things up and the way I implement things. So we can have at all these three levels some inference of the unknowns, which are, in this case, parameters, hyperparameters, and the model, which is like age, but which is yet another hyper hyperparameter. So we can have the posterior given the data and some fixed hyperparameter and hyper hyperparameter. We can have a, some expression, Bayesian expression, and we can also do this for the parameters and for the hyperparameters and so on and so forth. However, typically we cannot calculate these things anymore. They get ugly quite quickly. Yeah? So they get very non-Gaussian. That's basically what ugly means. Or if you want to speak mathematics, you say, um, if everything is Gaussian, we are doing linear algebra, and everything is easy. Yeah? If I'm um, non-Gaussian, then I'm beyond linear algebra, and suddenly now I have to do something more advanced. And in high dimensions, I think the topic is called al algebraic geometry, which is super fancy and super complicated, and not guaranteed to give us nice solutions. Um, so on level one, now for GPs, we have the prior for f, right, with some mean function and some covariance function, where I didn't write down now the parameters of the k0 and of the m0, because if I write it down like this, there are no hyperparameters. So basically, if I write it like that, the k0 has a fixed length scale, it has a fixed, we have a fixed noise variance, uh, which is a uh, parameter of the likelihood. We also have maybe a fixed periodicity, it's all fixed. And then we can write it up like that, and we can have a formula for the posterior. However, in level two, of course, we will add now these hyperparameters. And those are the ones that we now want to automatically learn with model selection. Okay? So we have another level above it. I don't know whether I'm saying here level one. Ah, OK. Here's, this is about the inference of level one. So now we have a hyper prior as well, if you want to be Bayesian about it. And then given our hyperparameter theta, where these theta are now the parameters of my kernel, and they typically also include the sigma squared. And then we just can do the same thing and get a posterior distribution for that one. So far, so good. Um, nothing fancy. We haven't used the hyper prior here at this point. However, in level two now, we want to do um, inference about the hyperparameter. And for that, we need the so-called marginal likelihood, which is basically the so-called evidence from level one. So if you write down the base rule for that one, p of f um, times p of y given f 
okay, divided by p of y. Then this p of y is the evidence, right? So that's the denominator of the base rule. And what's special about it, it is a function or a distribution of my observations, yeah, where my parameter is gone, okay, where I'm basically integrated out the parameter. So it's basically integrating out the nominator of the base rule, okay? So that is the nominator of the base rule. So it's the normalization constant, which we often don't care about because we are interested in the parameter. However, this normalization constant is, of course, a function of our hyperparameter. So we need to be, we, we need to use it in order to tune the hyperparameter. Okay, so far so good. So now if we would like to infer the hyperposterior, yeah, in that case now we would use the marginal likelihood, that one, and multiply it with the parameter of, uh, with the prior of our hyperparameters. And then again we have another evidence, so that is now the hyper evidence, right? So one from the hyper inference here. And that is getting too complicated and we can't do that anymore, yeah? So here we cannot be Bayesian. And for that reason we focus on the marginal likelihood and we just maximize this likelihood with respect to the hyperparameter theta. That's exactly like we did for Bayesian linear regression. Okay, so that is the usual way to deal with the hyperparameters in GP regression. So, with other words, we are Bayesian for the parameter and we are frequentist or maximum likelihood style for the hyperparameters. Okay? And we don't do it because we don't believe in Bayesian, we do it because we can't do it fully Bayesian, okay? We can, Bayesian only works nicely if the distributions are matching each other very well. So this is also called type 2 maximum likelihood, and as I just said, we are Bayesian about one but not about the other. So what are we doing now? We're doing exactly the same thing as we did for the Bayesian linear regression model selection. We derive the marginal likelihood, and it also looks very much the same as before, but now we have a kernel matrix in here, which, of course, depends on the kernel parameters, okay? And here you see already that it's a quite nonlinear function with respect to the kernel parameters. So here we have this linear thing, but then we have here the inverse of a big matrix, and each entry of this one yeah, contains the length scale, the input scale, and also the other periodicity, and all the other parameters that there might pop up in a complicated kernel function. Um, furthermore, all these parameters also appear in the log dead term back here. Yeah? And so this is quite complicated, and there's no closed form solution typically for the most of the kernel functions that we look at. So we can try to understand what we are doing here. So we are trying to maximize the marginal likelihood, which corresponds to maximizing this first term. Okay? And that basically means if I maximize the first term, it's like minimizing this product because of the minus sign. And since I'm minimizing something with an inverse matrix, it's like maximizing the matrix. So that's why I say the statement maximizing the first term corresponds to maximizing this matrix. That gets inverted and gets a minus sign. Okay? So in a way, we are trying to choose hyperparameter which makes the locations look similar. Okay, so what does that mean? Let me draw a picture on the board for that one. So let's say, um, <coughs> let's say my data set looks like this, okay? Um, like this, four data points. And now, here's my first choice for like a kernel function, right? I take a very small length scale, and that would mean that I'm having a little bump around that one, I'm having a little bump around that one, and a little bump, and a little bump. You might ask, so what have I been drawing here? I'm drawing basically this is a function, so let's say this is x1, x2, x3, x4, and this guy over here is k of x1, comma, dot. Okay, and this little bump is k of x2 comma dot, and so on and so forth. So why are those interesting functions to look at? Because at the end in GP we are taking a linear combination of all something like that, so we are kind of combining it. It's like a mixture of these things, like a mixture of Gaussian if I have a squared exponential. 
So this is kind of explaining me, so now if I have new data point, what's similar? So if that would be my length scale, and I have a new test point, which is in here, x0, it won't be similar to any of the other data points, so I won't be able to say anything about it, right? And that might be a bit too harsh, right? So the first term ensures that I'm making similar points similar. So maybe a better choice will be something like wider Gaussians, like this. And then that, that will result to an overall something like, like that. Yeah? So it's like a density that it's modeling now. So you see, in a way, by choosing the parameters of my kernel function, I'm doing kind of a density estimation of my data, kind of. Okay, but that is very hand wavy. Of course, this might be a good choice. However, the, to make everyone similar, there might be a better choice, right? So make them really wide, okay? And then everyone is friend of everyone, okay? So that's an even better choice. So the first term tries to go here, okay? However, there's a second term in our marginal likelihood. So the first term tries to make everyone as similar as possible, okay? Um, the second term, however, is trying to minimize the overall variance. Yeah? So that might be a bit more complicated to get the insight why the log dead is doing that. But basically, this is like the covariance. Yeah? The kernel matrix is the covariance, right? Plus sigma squared identity. That's like the covariance matrix of your noisy observations. By taking the determinant, I'm calculating the volume of this one. Yeah, so think of a one-dimensional matrix, a one-cross-one matrix. Then basically I'm having some variance, and the determinant is that variance. However, if I'm having a multi-dimensional variance, I'm having more like an ellipsoidal thing, and the determinant is calculating something like the volume of the ellipsoidal. Right? You know maybe that the determinant is calculating um, the volume of, of one of these quad-longs. What are they called, quad-longs? No, these, these kind of cubes. Like, but like they're oblong, I think they're called oblongs, oh, whatever. But there's a geometric thing which is like, oh, parallelotop, maybe parallelotop. So it's like a high dimensional parallelogram, okay? And the determinant is calculating the volume of that one, which corresponds to the vo volume of our high dimensional cigar. So it corresponds somehow to the spread of our data. And then the logarithm is kind of making it more invariant to length scale somehow. So to because by the logarithm, it becomes comparable to the expression that we're calculating here, OK? So, and then a minus sign. So maximizing this term will minimize the overall variance. So let's go back to our example here. So that might be make everyone super happy and everyone is friends with everyone, but this might be too wide, right? So that might be wasting too much variance. The variance is super large. So maybe that might be a better compromise. It makes points that are kind of close by, similar to each other, but not to everyone, OK? So it, it's more compact, yeah? So that is now just an interpretation of the math here. But you see, when you do it with Gaussian distributions, it typically you come up with an interesting story and it kind of makes sense. And so you see here some compromise. This is like a term that is kind of regularizing your parameters, yeah, by saying, have a small norm, right? Don't overdo it. Don't use arbitrary large numbers only to make the first number happy over here, right? But kind of try to find a small norm solution. And the first one is trying to fit the data, yeah, in a way. Yeah? Find the parameters to fit the data very well. Yeah, that is very similar to usual optimization problems that we have, where we say, OK, minimize some function um, uh, with respect uh, plus some lambda and then some whatever L2 norm of x and that is like minimize x. So that's like a usual optimization that you know from optimization, right? So you want to minimize that one but you regularize somehow with some least norm. The intuition is similar. So this is kind of limiting the complexity of your solution, limiting the variance of what you get and that is kind of trying to minimize the fit, okay? OK, but that's just like trying to, to, to teach you. So you can have a, a general view on that one, and it even matches the stuff that you've seen elsewhere. OK? OK, 
The last term, by the way, is there for completeness because I like to write equation signs. Okay? However, it's constant with respect to the parameters. So for the optimization, you can omit it. Okay? So far, so good. Let's run it. And we can run it in my little demo. But let's take a simple example, okay? Let's take a, because 12 dimensions is too much. Um, let's take that one, the super simple data set with not so many data points, so the code runs fast, okay? And then let's jump to the uh, role of finding the hyperparameter, blah. So that is finding the hyperparameter section. That is the marginal likelihood that you just seen. And now comes, uh, I, sh I tell you something about the log dead a second in a second, but here's the implementation of my log marginal likelihood, okay, which is just the formula that we've just seen, okay? And then um, I'm just doing some optimization. So I'm calling here scipy optimize minimize, which is doing something fancy, right? It's, in the simplest case, it's just doing gradient descent, but it might do something more fancy if it can, okay? And um, here I'm optimizing now over the hyperparameters. So let's try that. So let's, uh, I think I need to evaluate all of those. Um, okay, so that was the wrong one, blah, blah, blah. Let's run it. So it's reaching an optimum and then I get an error message. Oh no. Okay, it looks like I changed my code here. Missing three, plot GP is missing three, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me omit that one, okay? Because that was the prior. Oh no, it was the posterior. Let's see. Okay, so that is still plotting the posterior distribution. So that is now the fit with the hyperparameters. Again, to show you, so at the beginning, um, I'm having HP0, okay? So HP0 is the beginning. So let me also show you the plot for HP0. So that is maybe some beginning where the hyperparameters are just randomly assigned and they look okay, right? There's some variability over here, but I don't know whether I'm having the right trade-off, yeah? whether there's a solution which has a smaller overall variance, which is fitting the data also quite well. And when I do the optimization with maximizing the marginal likelihood, then I get a much nicer fit, okay? However, you could argue, okay, those are real waves here, so that is not really just noise, but this is something, because it looks like here the noise, like the vertical noise is much smaller than it is down here. So maybe there's something going on. However, I was assuming sigma squared to be everywhere the same, so I could also, of course, change my model that I have different amount of noise in different locations. And then I could plug it into a kernel and blah, 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 and do the Gaussian inference with it. Okay, so it's quite flexible. I also tried to run this code for the Mauna Lua data. However, with the 12 parameters, I couldn't get it to run like in a quick and dirty fashion. So maybe I was too ambitious. Maybe I was even trying to estimate the periodicity, but maybe that's something I should trust my domain expert and I just hardwire the 365 days and not trying to estimate those, right? So it's a trade-off, yeah? Okay, so far so good. So that is the GP regression story. Um, and let me tell you, it is quite nice, and it's still quite nice, even in the times of deep learning, yeah, because often data is one-dimensional, right? So our climate data here is one-dimensional. Of course, you could say, no, it's high-dimensional because we have stations all over the globe, right? So it's more complicated and we have many more problems. Okay, also for that cases, you could still apply GP regression. And you can nicely model prior distributions with that one. You can basically model very complicated prior knowledge into this one, and then you get some reasonable inference. Um, just also as an anecdote, um, some people don't like assumptions, and then they say, no, I'm a frequentist, I don't like assumptions, right? So I, I think it's bad to have a prior distribution. I think it's an illusion not to have prior assumptions, right? If you do an optimization like that, and you say, yeah, I'm doing it for numerical stability, yeah? Then you can come and say, oh, but this is like having a prior distribution uh, on your parameter, like a Gaussian prior on your x. So this is like the logarithm of e to the minus norm of x. And so it is like, so you could derive it in a Bayesian fashion, this kind of expression, yeah, by um, um, having a Bayesian way of reasoning. 
Um, then maybe a frequentist says, no, I only do maximum likelihood. So that's, I don't like to write down priors. That's a bad idea. Um, then you could say, but writing down the likelihood is already also quite a big assumption, right? I mean, one that is very well established, but it is an assumption on your model. Um, nonetheless, garbage in, garbage out. So if your prior is like totally unreasonable, then you can get totally unreasonable results. Or if you have some, um, so where's this picture? So now, can I really trust these, these width of these priors, uh, of the, 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 the noise, var the variance over here? Can I really trust it? You can only trust it as much as you believe in your prior, okay? So if you say your trial was kind of eyeballing, then the answer of the machine here is also, okay, something like that. However, like conceptually, it tells you something, that the variance down here is larger where you have fewer data points and smaller where you have more data points. In a way, of course, oh yeah, of course, this is trivial. But this is a method which also can, can tell you that very explicitly. And it might not be always as obvious like that one, okay? So I think it's always a good idea to try GPs. However, I, I guess if you're in a company, uh, like let's say after you finish your studies, they want you to run deep learning on the data set that they have. But maybe on a side notebook, try something simple. Try something like linear regression, for example, and see whether you get better results than with some super complicated deep learning model. Often, practitioners have the misconception they have a very small data set with 1,000 data points, and then they want to do deep learning with billions of parameters. And of course, it doesn't work. And that's why these classical methods like GPs and linear regression and maybe also SVMs are still very, very much um, reasonable to, to look at, okay? So far, so good. That's enough for the preaching part. So let's look at another topic. Of, of course, if there's regression, there's also classification. So there's the support vector machines. They are super successful in classification problems. And now you are a GP researcher 20 years ago. You say, oh, we are so good at regression. We have so nice interpretation. We should try to tweak our method to also do classification. And that has been done before. Classification, um, also linear regression has been turned into classification. So why not use the same trick and then have classification as well? And that's what we're doing in the rest of the lecture. So first of all, let's quick reminder of the Bayesian inference. So typically, we have some prior distribution for the unknown. Then we have some likelihood. And those could be different distributions. They don't have to be the same. However, it's very nice if then the posterior has the same shape as our prior distribution. And in that case, we are talking about a conjugate prior. Okay, So the better distribution is the conjugate prior to a binomial likelihood. And as I said, there's a big Wikipedia page on conjugate priors, OK? Similarly, the GP process regression problem can be understood like that. So the GP prior is a conjugate prior for the Gaussian likelihood, OK? Meaning the posterior distribution is, again, from the same distribution class as the prior, OK? So it's also a GP1. So that is very nice. And that is always a very good setup. Why? Because it's kind of defining some learning machine. Yeah, I'm now talking computer scientist lingo. So we see no data. We can sample from our prior and see whether it's reasonable what we get out. Then we see some data, and we update our beliefs. And then tomorrow, we continue and collect more data. And we can continue to update yesterday's posterior is today's prior. Okay? And that's like a very nice mechanism, yeah, which, I, which I like a lot. So far, so good. Um, okay, those were just some technical details. What is really Gaussian process regression? There are these formulas, which are like the relevant ones. Okay, let's move to Gaussian process classification. And I'm again following Rasmus and Williams' excellent book on GPs. However, I worked out some of the equations that I didn't understood with a little bit more detail. So again, I think if there's something you don't understand in my lecture, please go through the book, and then the stuff that you don't understand in the book please look at my lecture. Yeah? So they match each other, maybe, in, in something, or they are dual to each other in what is missing. So how can we model classification? So suppose we are given some training data now, but now we have locations with labels. Okay? There are, let me first draw a picture, maybe, on the board. So um, 
So here are my x and there are my y's. And typically now I would draw something wiggly over here, but now it's different. So now I'm having here my, my locations, x1, x2, x3. And now I'm having only two possible values, 0 and 1. Okay, And maybe the x1 is uh, the 0 and the x3 is the 1. Okay, And it could be that maybe over here I'm getting an x4 and I'm again having like a 0 label. And this is very different from the typical regression thing. However, nonetheless, of course, yeah, why not draw like a line through these points, right? So what would be a good line? Yeah, maybe back here, I'm very confident that I'm 0, OK? But then here now, I need to increase a little bit. And then I'm slowly going down again. OK, that would be a line. And what is this line describing now? This line is something like the probability of y being equal to 1, given that I'm at location x. OK? So why is that nice? Because somehow we can reduce such a classification problem to a regression problem. OK? So we could now say, this is my data set, but somehow this data set is telling me something about p of y given x. So let's use the p of y given x, and let's do Gaussian process regression on it. OK? So that is the basic idea that we are going to follow now. Um, of course, there are always two approaches, generative approach and the discriminative approach. And we typically follow the discriminative approach, so which is basically saying, OK, there is training data x, y, so there's a joint distribution, of course, right? But typically, we only model p of y given x. And we don't care for the p of x. That's also the common way that we do in regression, right? We ignore the p of x, and we just model the p of y given x. Um, and the, 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 the slogan here is, we directly model what we want. We only want the function from x to y. We don't care for the distribution of x. That's density estimation, yet another problem. Too difficult or too unclear. Let's only solve what we really need. However, there's another approach, the so-called generative approach, which is basically, in this case now, I've wrote it differently. So by product rule, you can also swap those two. And we could model um, the distribution of the labels. Yeah, which is like very easy to calculate. We just count the zeros, and we calculate the ones. And then we basically have a Bernoulli distribution. right? So the p of y is super simple. And the p of x given y might be also simple. So we could assume a Gaussian. So this should be a curly n. I should, I should change that one. So we could say, given that I'm in class 0, I'm having a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean and variance. And if I'm in class 1, I'm also having yet another one. Okay, and in that case, we would also have modeled p of x. That could be that's basically our know, mixture of Gaussian. Yeah? However, typically what we are doing, we are typically using the discriminative approach because this is not, we are not wasting our resources. And it's typically simpler to directly learn the function that we want. Um, there's some side note here. And I think I didn't went into this in the context of causality. But it's also sometimes a choice between learning the causal or the anti-causal direction. And there's some more to say about it. If you're interested in causality, you might want to look at causal versus anti-causal learning, a nice ICML paper from 2012. Yeah? Where here's the link to if you want to download it. But let's not spend time on that one. So I've shown you already a picture on the blackboard. OK, there are one-dimensional locations right now. And we have these classes 1 and 0. And then somehow we can have a decision function where now Decision function would be now to say, OK, if whether this function is greater or equal 0.5. So that would be now a decision function. If it's greater or equal 0.5, I say class 1. Otherwise, I say 0. However, we don't have to use a decision function, right? I mean, this is even more fancy, right, if you get the probability. Yeah? So for example, uh, let's say credit card fraud. That's like also a classical example in machine learning. So what is the probability that a certain transaction that someone did with their credit card was a fraud or not? Okay, So the probability is super interesting. And then you can kind of tune your threshold. For example, you can also tune it depending on the size of the transaction. Maybe a super large transaction, you double check, even if it's only a small probability of having a fraud. And uh, if you buy a coffee and it looks like a fraud because you bought a coffee in 
uh, whatever in Kinshasa, but you most have your transactions here in Dortmund, then maybe that, that maybe it's it's reasonable to say okay whatever. So the, the, the costs are so low. Okay, so to to apply linear regression to classification. So now how are we doing it? First idea we've seen already. So we do regression on the classification probabilities. Yeah. So we learn this function. Luckily. By having p of y being equal to plus 1, we also have p of y being equal to minus 1, but by saying 1 minus this number. Okay, So we only need to model 1. <coughs> the problem here might be, now if we apply linear regression, we get arbitrarily large and small real numbers, yeah? but um, probabilities should be between 0 and 1. And for this, we need another idea. So here's the second idea. We need to turn any real numbers into probabilities using a link function. And we've seen that already. So we've seen already the sigmoidal function, which is exactly a function like that. So that is a function that takes the interval from minus infinity to plus infinity. Or I think on the video it's minus infinity to plus infinity. And it squ squashes it between 0 and 1. Okay. However, there are others. So we could also take the um, the cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian distribution, where here's another uh, cameo, e uh, cameo appearance of the Gaussian distribution. So again, this has nothing to do with Gaussian process. The choice is arbitrary. I can plug in any distribution, and I would get a nice link function. Okay, Because also the C CMF, the cumulative uh, CDF, it's also a function that outputs the number between 0 and 1. Um, if I'm using this Gaussian distribution, the whole thing is also called the probit function. Yeah? This is called the logistic function. This is the probit function. And those are two options to turn real numbers into probabilities. So um, I could apply it to such a regression function. Yeah? And the, the results look very similar. But this is from minus 4 to plus 4 scaled. Right? And this is now from 0 to 1. And furthermore, the shape side of kind of changes a little bit, right? So these things are more compressed into a smaller interval. That's why they're also the derivatives kind of shade of that one. Yeah? And this is like squashing the output of a regression to get a probability. So it has been done before in linear regression. Yeah? So if I'm assuming a Gaussian prior, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm applying, um, uh, I could model basically the probability distribution here by my logistic link function and plug in now the xi transpose w. So that is the output of my linear regression function, plus and bias, for example, maybe, but maybe not. And just by plugging it into this logistic function, I'm getting a number between 0 and 1. And I say, OK, I'm modeling my p of y given x yeah, now as this approximation, which depends on the parameter w that I want to learn. And that is logistic regression. OK, so logistic regression is linear regression applied to classification, where I'm using this link function. And of course, there's also probit regression, where I just use another link function. OK, so far so simple. Note, typically, I'm having link functions which are symmetric, where symmetric means that sigma of a negative number is 1 minus sigma of that number. Yeah? So that's just a property. Some symmetric property. And that is nice, because then I can just omit the equals plus 1. And I could say, OK, p of y given xi, comma w is sigma of y1 multiplied now with that one. Yeah, so if I'm having y1 being equal to 1, everything is fine as before. If I'm having y1 being equal to minus 1, I can use the symmetry over here, and I'm getting exactly 1 minus this probability. Yeah? So that is just a nice notation that is commonly used. OK, now we are still with linear regression here. So I'm having a prior and a likelihood. But my likelihood now is slightly not complicated. In particular, it's non-Gaussian. right? So this is not a Gaussian distribution anymore. However, the posterior can be derived. yeah, And it is done in our nice GP book on page 37. But the result is non-Gaussian. So you get some expression. yeah. So you can derive the posterior distribution of w. So that is possible for logistic regression. So basically, what I've shown you here is Bayesian logistic regression. And it's also possible to derive the posterior predictive distribution. 
However, that can be only written as an integral. And this one cannot be calculated either because the posterior distribution is non-Gaussian and the sigma of something is also something non-Gaussian. So maybe you are lucky and you find something in Abramovitz Stegun in this book of functions that you already have now on your, on your board. No, I don't buy it, but have a look in the library at it. So there are all the answers to some fancy functions in there. And, but I, I doubt it, right? If it would have been known, people would have put it into the book as well. So, and now today, in the following stuff, it will be all about, so who's Gaussian and who's not Gaussian anymore? So what things can we still do that are nice in GP regression? And which things now do we have to repair since we want to do classification? Just for visualization, so this is the prior distribution of W1 and W2, just some Gaussian distribution. Then there are some data points now in X space. So there are two classes, the stars and the circles. And if you calculate the posterior distribution with the formula that we've seen on the previous slide, you get some distribution like that, where you now see the isolines are no circles anymore, and there are also no ellipses, right? So if there would be really ellipses, in that case, we would have a Gaussian distribution, but they are not. So you see it's non-Gaussian. On the other hand, it's also no, not looking too wild, right? So maybe you can approximate it with the Gaussian, right? And that is exactly what we are going to do for the GPs. So this posterior distribution here will get approximated with the Gaussian distribution. And how do you do it? Okay, there's a maximum somewhere, right? So let's take that as the mean of our Gaussian. And then there's these isolines. Let, so let's try to find like a Gaussian distribution with approximately the same shape. And that's a Laplace approximation. A Laplace approximation approximates a non-Gaussian distribution with a Gaussian distribution right at the maximum, okay? So we get to that. So we are still at linear regression. So what are the advantages now of doing that? We get really probabilities, which is quite nice, and that's beyond a typical support vector machine, right? The support vector machine gives you 0, 1. But here we model the probabilities. However, the probabilities actually do depend on our assumptions, right? So they depend on the parameters of our GP regression, and they depend on our link function. So there's no real objectivity here. There's only, as I said, garbage in, garbage out. So if you have assumptions and you have a good reason to really believe in the logistic function, and if you really have strong reason to believe in your prior for your W, then you can trust your probabilities. Of course, now you're a practitioner, you're in a company. Can you trust your probabilities or not? How do you proceed? You just try different things. Try probit, try logistic, fiddle around with the parameters, and then compare the probabilities. If they all agree, you can conclude it doesn't matter, okay? So you can just use any choice. If there's one which is totally different, better avoid that one and take the one that more agree with itself, okay? Disadvantages, the math gets complicated. We are not Gaussian anymore, okay? So now let's study the GP classification and let's identify the parts that are non-Gaussian and then I show you how to deal with them. And I hope I'm not going too much over time, okay? I'm also super hungry. So don't worry. But I go a little bit over time. Let me promise you that one already. Okay, so let's first start. What pieces of the GP regression are Gaussian, okay? And I'm repeating that. I mean, we know that all pieces are Gaussian, but I repeat it to introduce the notation that I then will also use for the classification, okay? So here's another cartoon image of the GP regression. This time, in a way, for a single data point, but if you look closely, it's a capital X. So those are my locations, my finitely many locations. F is my function, and F sub X is my function evaluated at these locations. And then y is the noisy measurement of my f sub x, okay? So again, why is it nice to distinguish here between the f and the y? Because net noise is important, and as I discussed, sometimes you, your, you know your observations are noisy, but your posterior predictive distribution, you are interested in the non-noisy estimate because you really want to find the function. However, here it is especially nice because we are going to apply a link function to the f sub x. Right? So in our case, for classification later on, the so y will be 0 or 1. Okay? So then it's nice to distinguish between the GP regression stuff, 
and then our observation, which is like collapsing it to 0 or 1. So to write it down, we have a GP prior on F. Um, then for our measure, uh, for our true values of the function, now I'm using here a delta function, right? So that is a delta distribution, which has all these weird properties. Let's not worry about it too much. Let's just say it's 1 if this is equal to 0, and it's 0 otherwise. So it's like the Iverson brackets. But in a way, um, again, let me just have a little picture for the delta function. The delta function is a little bit different. So this is 0, and it's, it's the limit of these bumps. So the variance gets smaller and smaller, and the height gets larger and larger. So in principle, and we will reach the delta function, delta of x. So that is kind of like, uh, I shouldn't write something like that, but OK, let's say for n against infinity, or let's say the variance is going, uh, OK, let's try to write it. So if, my, if I have a Gaussian distribution with mean 0 and some variance sigma square, OK, and I let the sigma square go to 0, OK, you always might want to know what you get. And the object that you get is this delta, so the delta distribution, OK? So it's a weird thing. In my head, it's 0 everywhere, but at the origin where it's 1. But actually, it's not 1. It's something infinite, OK? Because when you integrate against it, something weird is happening. But it is like the Iverson bracket, very much like it. So for that reason, I'm writing this distribution like that. And I leave it to the observer whether this is infinity or 1, OK? Um, the difficulty here is always switching from continuous distributions to discrete distributions, right? So that's always here the difficulty. OK, and then there's something simple. There's a Gaussian observation at the end. So we are in the regression regime. And those are all the things that you've seen already before. Now, we can also, often we are interested in p of f given x, and we want to integrate out our gp prior, OK? So this gives us another description. And you can do it, but once you plug in the delta, everything gets a little bit funny. So I have the famous then a miracle occurs notation here. Okay, So this is only hand wavy. One should give you like a hint. But the content is correct. So this distribution is, of course, a Gaussian distribution. Why am I so sure? That is the defining property of a Gaussian process, that if I collapse it at finitely many locations, I'm having a Gaussian distribution. But I'm lacking the skills to really write it down nicely, because I don't know enough about distribution theory. Maybe that's something for the semester break. OK, so far so good. So this is Gaussian process regression. And we kind of can get rid of this GP thing here when we just say oh, the P of Y is given our functional values already is, oh, no, no, sorry. So in this one, I got rid kind of of the f because it's, it's nicer to talk about finite objects. And so it's fi nicer to talk about finitely many locations and the finitely many values, and they are Gaussian distributed. And similarly for our measurements. And now in GP regression, if we do now have a new data point, we can extend the diagram like that, and we have the usual equation that you've all seen many times before. Um, now let's see. Why is everything Gaussian? So why is the predictive distribution of y given the data, the observed data in my new location Gaussian? Because everything is Gaussian. So the p of y is my measurement. That is the Gaussian distribution. What about this one? So that is the more complicated term, which is written down here. I think the ordering is not optimal. And if you write it out, it's an integral where we have um, this distribution, which can be shown to be Gaussian, and that distribution, which can be shown to be Gaussian as well. OK, so here everything is Gaussian. So we are super happy with GP regression. However, now let's turn to classification. And there's a couple of things are changing. We still have a GP prior. We still have a Gaussian distribution for the function values, for the true functional values, so for the f sub x. However, for the y's, now I'm using this link function stuff, OK? And that is something that is very non-Gaussian. So that is very different. I mean, it is already non-Gaussian because 
Y is a discrete variable, right? So it's a variable that is either 0 or 1. So it cannot be Gaussian. Of course, we can also again ask, so what is, um, why is the predictive distribution really not Gaussian? So what is the term that breaks it here? And that would be the one that we would like to calculate. However, we typically can't because the whole thing is non-Gaussian. So let's look at the details. So um, the first part, of course, that is the link function, right? So that is non-Gaussian. However, the second part here is also non-Gaussian. And that is the one that we would like to repair with the Laplace approximation. So both are non-Gaussian. And if we repair one, then we can approximate this integral. So but why is this term non-Gaussian? Um, for that one, let's write it out. So it's the same as the one, the second one down here. And it can be written as an integration over all possible f sub x, where f sub x now is a vector, right? It's not a function. And um, first note, OK, the first term is a Gaussian distribution. That's the identical one from GP regression. It only gets non-Gaussian when we talk about the y's. OK, if we don't talk about the y's, we are still in, in our, our fantasy land where everything is pink and everyone is happy. OK, so there where everything is Gaussian. However, here's a term that involves the y. And if we have a closer look at that one, yeah, then we have the previous expression, which we can now write down, I think, with Bayes rule which is p of y given fx and p of x given x. And the right-hand side term, that one is Gaussian. But the p of y given f sub x is non-Gaussian because that is basically, again, an application of the link function. OK? So now, again, the reasoning. I'm interested in the predictive distribution. For the GP regression, everything was Gaussian. For the classification, it's not. Both terms are non-Gaussian. This one, however, is a simple link function. And this is a complicated term, which kind of makes reference to the training data set. So that will be the non-Gaussian term that we will later approximate with our Laplace approximation. <coughs> to go into more detail here, so basically, it can be written as an integration over all possible function values, where part of the integral is Gaussian, but the other part is not because it makes reference to the link function as well. OK, so that is the reasoning. Maybe I should reshuffle the ordering on this slide. Then the explanation is easier. I am always get confused every year when I explain this. How can we now do inference? How can we do something about it? We do a Laplace approximation of one of the terms. And of course, we could have picked that one. yeah. But typically, we pick the p of f given x comma y term. So that is the one that gets now approximated with a Laplace approximation. So let me write it out for you. So this term, which is causing part of the trouble, gets approximated now with a new distribution, which we call q. We call it q to distinguish it from the ones where, where we basically come from the model assumptions. Okay, So that is just another function. And it's defined to be a Gaussian distribution, of course, of f sub x, but with some mean. And in the following now, I have to explain you how to calculate this mean. And with some covariance. In the following, I have to explain how to calculate this variance. OK? So now, what does it buy us? So it buys us that this term gets Gaussian by plugging in the q. And then this integration can be done. And we get a Gaussian distribution for the f star, uh, fx star which we can plug into this integral up here. However, our predictive distribution is still not Gaussian, right? It cannot be, because we are talking about a Bernoulli variable here. So this then becomes some one-dimensional integration, which we can approximate with numerical methods. Why is it one-dimensional? Oh, because we are only integrating over the functional value of the x star. So let's flip back to the image. So this is just one real number here. Yeah, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And we approximate an integration over this 1D variable against some Gaussian distribution that we get from the data. And that gives us our posterior predictive distribution. OK, so let's work on the question how we can do this approximation. OK, so by the way, oh yeah, in Rasmussen Williams, there are also alternatives to Laplace approximation. So there are other methods from Bayesian inference that can be used to approximate this, to do 
classification with Gaussian processes. And then, of course, you could imagine when this was a hot topic, people were comparing different approximations, and I guess in the book they also compare it. And they all have trade-offs. Yeah? You typically won't get a free lunch. So here's the Laplace approximation. Um, oh, this is all I explained already. So if we approximate our term with some Gaussian distribution, then we get a Gaussian distribution for the functional value, as I just discussed already. Yeah? So there is a solution to that one. And we give it a name. We also call it Q of something, right? But it's a different Q because here we have the input is a different F. So this is F sub X star, and this is F sub X. OK, so I'm using the Q similar. I'm using the probability P. Yeah? OK, this can now be plugged into my average predictive probability. And this is a one-dimensional integral where we can calculate it via sampling or via other methods numerically. OK, so this can be done. So now, how do we get now our approximation? And this, we look at this in a more general case. So let's say we have some P of Z, which might be some PDF, some non-Gaussian PDF, and we would like to approximate it with the Gaussian distribution. Basically, now the goal is, how do, if, do I find these parameters? OK? So a slightly similar idea is to say, let's approximate the log PDF with a second order polynomial. Yeah? So what is this now? OK, if I'm taking the logarithm on both sides, I'm having the logarithm of P of Z and of the logarithm of this Gaussian distribution. And the relevant term yeah, where the data appears is basically this minus 0 0.5 times blah, 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 blah. OK? Um, however, now I'm a little bit confused, because what about the constant term? I think I need to include here the constant term as well, OK? The log dead of the covariance matrix. I think I should. Uh, do I have to do it? Ah, no, I don't have to do it. OK, great that we had the thought. So at first sight, it looks like, OK, you are after the sigma sub z, right? So you should include all the terms from the Gaussian distribution where the sigma sub z is included. However, I don't, because um, I can normalize it. So I need to put something plus constant in here, because um, I can always rescale the whole thing to normalize it. OK, and that corresponds to, yeah, is it true or not? Yeah, it is. Ah, I think I leave that open. I leave that open, OK, for, for my reading again the chapter in Rasmus and Williamson. So here's some subtlety that I don't understand exactly. Do I need the constant term or not? OK, I, I think I don't need it, but let's go on. OK, so we want to approximate the PDF. We want to approximate the log PDF with a second order polynomial. And that is basically the same as saying, I want to approximate the log PDF with the second order Taylor expansion at the maximum. Where the point, of course, is arbitrary where I'm doing it, right? I could also approximate it somewhere else. But it's probably a good idea to do it at the maximum. So now, that step from here to here might come as a surprise. But when you look at this, this is a second order polynomial. And the Taylor expansion of second order is a second order polynomial, right? So why not just do a Taylor expansion of my log P of Z, and then I have my parameters for my second order polynomial that approximate the log PDF. And then I'm having basically the parameters of my Gaussian PDF. OK? So you see now, Laplace approximation is exactly the same as a second order Taylor expansion of the log PDF. That's it. So if you know all the words in this sentence, if you know what a Taylor expansion is and a second order, then this is telling everything. You can also put it on your t-shirt for your next party. Question? Ah, OK. Uh, I'm just rephrasing my approximation. I'm always doing the same approximation. So the approximation of fitting a Gaussian to a difficult PDF is exactly the same as approximating the log PDF with a second order polynomial. So that's the reason because this Gaussian PDS is a second order, is e to the minus the second, second order polynomial. So if I take logarithms, the, the first point is exactly the same as the second point. The second point is exactly the same as the third point because that is a second order polynomial, and that's exactly what the Taylor expansion is doing. 
However, I'm free to choose like the, the point where I want to do the expansion, and I'm doing at the maximum. Okay? So let's write it out. So there's some constant term, fine. So I'm doing it around z hat, which is the maximum of my log PDF. Um, and then I, I'm having a linear term, right? So this is the first derivative times the distance. So this is like the multivariate version of the Taylor expansion. I hope you are not afraid against that anymore. And this is the quadratic term, which is a quadratic form of like the double num nabla, where double nabla basically is the Hessian matrix. Okay? So that is the Hessian. And um, why is the choice maybe a good idea at the maximum? Um, so let's say this is your distribution. So it's a little bit skewed, right? Of course, I could have a Gaussian distribution around here and could try to approximate it with the Gaussian. That is possible, but that approximation is just not very good. So instead, I'm taking the maximum, and then I'm trying to find a Gaussian distribution around that one. That's a much better one. It covers much more math, uh, mass. Of course, let's say I'm having this PDF, and I'm doing a Laplace approximation to it, find the maximum, which is over here, and then fitting a Gaussian distribution to it. Yeah? Of course, you are completely missing the second bump. So a Laplace approximation is very nice for unimodal distributions. Unimodal means there's a single mode. There's a single maximum. Okay? Then it's like something nice. Um, now, speaking in, in um, let's go to, so this is p of x. Let's look at the log p of x, OK? So I'm not super good at drawing it, but it's going down to 0. Going down to z 0 means going down to minus infinity, OK? So it's something like, I don't know, groups, and then it's going again very small, and then it's going like this, and again something like that. Now, in log p of x, I'm approximating this with the parabola yeah, by taking the maximum. Logarithm is a monotonic function, so this maximum is this maximum. Yeah, so far, so good. And then I'm fitting a parabola to that one. And that is my approximation. Yeah? That is very much like you do in gradient descent. You approximate your function with a linear function, and you do one step. In Newton methods, you're approximating your function by a quadratic function, actually. And then you jump right to the optimum. That's why you need to multiply with the inverse Hessian, if you know Newton method from numerics. So in a way, Newton methods is doing a Laplace approximation. Yeah, to the, it's doing something like a Laplace approximation. It's doing basically the same. But here we are talking about densities and not about log densities. OK, so far so good. Um, I'm almost done. So here's a second order Taylor expansion at the arc max, okay? And that is a Gaussian approximation, yeah? So this, it can be written that this is approximately the same, yeah? And now we choose the maximum for a certain reason. That is nice because then we know that the gradient is equal to zero, okay? That is a property. So that's good because then this term just disappears which is making this even more look like a Gaussian distribution, right? And note that the psi of f of x is constant, yeah? so there's nothing happening. Thus, we have obtained the following Gaussian approximation, where I here omitted the constant terms, and I need to look it up whether that's OK or not. But I think it is OK. Um, so my Gaussian distribution now has two parameters, f, x, hat. That's the one that we already have. And then there's this a to the minus 1, which is like minus the Hessian, OK? And why is it minus the Hessian? Because we need a minus sign here in front, OK? So we want a function that looks like this, and not a function that looks like that, right? OK, so now how do we find that one and the a? For this, we need another slide. So first of all, um, we can rewrite it now. We can, we can rewrite this psi of f of x, which is the logarithm of, or let's define the psi to be the logarithm of this p that we want to approximate. And we can also rewrite it using Bayes' rule, yeah, where 
the, now the last term is really constant with the interesting stuff, so I omit that one. It's constant with respect to f sub x, so I can omit it, okay, so in this case it's fine. And I have these two terms, and now when we look at these two terms, the second term here contains the kernel matrix, okay, and the first term, it depends on my kernel function, so that's a bit more complicated, yeah? But now in principle, I can calculate the derivatives of that term, and if I do, I will end up with the Hessian being some matrix W, which depends on the first term here, yeah? Oh, it's not depending on the kernel function, it depends on the link function, sorry. Yeah, so this is about the link function. And here comes the kernel matrix. And now that is my matrix minus A, okay? So that is now a bit quick, but the story is just, so I can calculate the parameters of the Laplace approximation for the Gaussian um, uh, process situation by calculating the maximum, yeah? So that is one thing, and I can get it by Newton's method. So this can be done um, just by optimization. Why do they mention here Newton's method? Because we have the Hessian calculated. So you can really very quickly calculate the optimum. But you can also use whatever, gradient descent or whatever, to find the maximum. Just use one method to find the maximum. And then the covariance matrix we get by taking the inverse kernel matrix, and then there's some other term, minus w, which depends on the link function. And that is one that we need to look up in a table of the link function. So far so good? Approximately. So now what do we gain? We now have an approximation derived for the non-Gaussian distribution, yeah? where the parameters of that one, the first one can be obtained by gradient descent or Newton method, yeah? and the second parameter can be calculated by calculating the kernel matrix, inverting it, and adding some term that we get from the link function. Okay, now this can be plugged into our integral that we were unable to do, and now we can do it again by using some tricks or some formulas from the Gaussian distribution lecture, and we get an approximation of the distribution that we need to calculate the average predictive probability. So now we have an integration where we have here Gaussian distribution, and then we have a link function. So why does it make a big difference whether we have a Gaussian distribution back here or not if we want to approximate this integration? The reason is, if we want to sample from these values, yeah, it's very easy to sample from a Gaussian distribution, but it's not very easy to sample from a super complicated distribution, okay? It's like saying, these parameters that we calculated here, they are nicely summarizing the essence so the mean is telling us a lot, and the covariance matrix is telling us a lot, and that gives us a good approximation to this integration. However, if that would be a non-Gaussian distribution, sampling from this to calculate this integration would be very, very difficult. Okay? So far, so good. The, the piece that I omitted was the W, but the W, again, can be found in closed-form solution for the different variants of your link functions that you are interested in, okay? It only depends on the link function. So far, so good. Let's have a quick summary. The super quick summary is GP regression is easy, GP classification is not so easy, okay? So that is the summary. So GP processes are designed for regression. They are like a natural generalization of Gaussian distributions. G GP classification now is a little bit a hack, but it can be done, okay? It can be done. And Laplace approximation is nothing to be ashamed of. That's like a valid mathematical method. We often approximate stuff, right? That's like very common to do that. Anyway, we have finitely many data points, so approximations are, are very good, and to calculate the exact thing won't be the exact thing anyway because we've only seen finitely many data points. Okay, so far so good. That's it for Gaussian processes. Next time we start with a new topic. Thanks for your attention.